May, handing over to Colvin to look at COVID-19 and best practice for returning to the workplace. Great, thanks uh, Nigel and um, afternoon everyone. Um, or oh, morning if you're joining from the US. Um, so Boris Johnson has signaled that um, the work from home guidance will be lifted on June 21st. Um, so while not everyone will be rushing back to the office, I think we can start to expect uh, more office-based working and a push by most companies uh, to encourage their employees to spend at least some of their time um, in the office. Um, so whilst we're in a different situation to um, where we were probably nine months ago when people started to return to the office, um, in terms of the pandemic, it's still a threat. Um, and I think uh, there seems to be weekly news of, of, of new strains and uncertainty as to whether the current uh, vaccines will be able to um, immunize us against these new strains. So there is still a threat in terms of the pandemic and there are a myriad of issues to consider uh, when returning to the office from employment relations to health and safety and of course privacy. So I'm going to look briefly at some of the overarching key issues from a privacy perspective in terms of managing the return to the office, setting out some practical actions and a few frequently asked questions that uh, we're dealing with on a, on a regular basis. So firstly, looking at the um, uh, key principles, um, one of the main issues to highlight is that um, in um, managing sort of return to work and COVID-19 COVID concerns, there's an inevitable processing of health data. And that's really important to recognize um, because health data is subject to more stringent obligations um, under the GDPR. And health data can include um, things like COVID symptoms, so whether someone has a cough or loss of taste or loss of smell or a high temperature, uh, vaccination records, um, COVID test results, and that's the case whether the results are uh, positive or negative, because even if they're, they're negative, they, they do tell you something about someone's health, and um, temperature test results. So that was quite popular um, uh, in the autumn when people started um, uh, their, their, their return to work. So it's an important that you recognize that you are collecting um, more sensitive information so you can actually take appropriate um, um, action. So in terms of the, some of the key principles that you need to think about, now these are enshrined in the, in, in the GDPR. I've not covered all of them here, but um, really the most relevant um, to the sorts of issues relating to um, dealing with a pandemic and um, returning to work. So these are called the, the, the data protection principles. So the first one is around um, data minimization. So this is really about keeping the data you collect to a minimum. So you should only be collecting uh, information, and that includes health data, that you absolutely that you only need to take the measures required to keep staff safe. So no more than that. So in some cases, some information only needs to be held for a short period of time. Um, so there's no need to come to create a, um, a permanent record. Transparency. So it's very important to be transparent with your employees. Again, this is a key um, data protection principle under the GDPR. Employees have a right to know um, how their information will be handled. So what you collect and how you use it. Um, and it's important to note that some employees may be affected by some of the measures you intend to implement. For example, staff may not be able to work. So you need to be mindful of this and make sure you tell people how and why you wish to use their personal information, including uh, what the implications will be. You should also let employees know um, who, you sh who, who you will share their information with and how long you intend to keep it. Um, there are also some general information that you need to, 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 to disclose in terms of um, where you store the data and, and um, um, how you keep it secure. And on the note of security, that's a, a fundamental uh, data protection principle under the GDPR. And um, it's particularly important in relation to um, health data. You have to keep people's information secure. And sort of related to that is delete it when you no longer need it. So given that the information is more sensitive, um, there are more stringent obligations um, in terms of um, keeping the information secure. So you should really be considering additional security measures. 
uh, things like stricter access controls. So making sure that um, only people who need to have access to the data have access and password protecting the records. So that in case that if someone does stumble across them that they can't automatically get access to the data. Encryption, uh, that's very important from a 5G perspective, making sure that the data is encrypted at rest and, and also uh, potentially when it's being um, uh, shared. And things like read-only access and additional training, um, particularly for those employees that are handling this type of information. Uh, another key principle under the, un, under the GPR is, is in relation to staff rights. Um, so organizations uh, must inform individuals about their rights in relation to personal data, such as the, the right of access, the right of um, rectification, and staff must be given the opportunity to exercise those rights um, and discuss any concerns they have with their employers. Um, proportionality and fairness, um, also a fundamental principle under, under the GDPR. You need to really make sure that any measures that you implement to deal with um, the return to work and um, uh, managing um, the pandemic are proportionate to what you're trying to, to achieve. So you really need to consider um, um, whether the measures you, that you are looking to implement um, are intrusive. And if they're intrusive, see if there is some way to make them um, as least intrusive as they could possibly be. Um, also, if you're making decisions about your staff based on um, health information, you need to make sure that your approach is fair. So think carefully about um, you know, the impact that your policy might have on staff and make sure that it doesn't cause any kind of discrimination. So considering these principles and um, how you turn these into um, practical actions, um, Jess, if we could turn to the next slide. So the key kind of practical actions and recommendations that you need to be taking. Firstly, um, provide a supplemental COVID-19 privacy notice. Um, so that really deals with your um, uh, obligations under, under uh, transparency and making sure that employees really know about these new uses of data. Um, uh, I would suggest it's best to create a separate notice um, rather than sort of hard code it into your existing em employee privacy notice. So at the moment you'll have a, an existing privacy notice um, to satisfy um, um, any data you're, you're, you're processing now as an employer. Um, it will be best in the context of COVID to keep that separate because hopefully the situation is only temporary. Um, I mentioned before that um, um, where you don't need to, you should not be creating a permanent record. Um, so I think a good example of this is in relation to, to test results. So think very carefully about the data you're collecting and actually whether you need to re uh, retain it permanently. Um, uh, when staff are collecting um, um, uh, information from employees, it's really important to make sure that they're not over collecting. And also the employees on, uh, that are sharing the information, make sure that they're not oversharing. Because there is, um, I think, a risk in this particular scenario to sometimes over collect or, or, or overshare. You know, so for example, um, um, you know, when a line manager or maybe someone in HR is, is um, collecting information about someone's um, uh, COVID symptoms, they don't necessarily need to collect, you know, the precise symptoms. You don't need to know that someone has a high temperature or they've lost their, their taste or they've lost their smell or they've got a continuous cough. That's, uh, that information is, is, is not really relevant. I think all you would need to collect and ultimately record um, is the fact that someone has COVID-19. You know, similarly, if there are concerns about an employee returning um, to the office because you know, their daughter has severe um, chronic asthma, um, uh, that is not the sort of information that you, um, you would need to collect. All you would need to collect is the fact that um, um, there is a family member who is critically vulnerable. Uh, and so I think it's important to give some guidance and, and, and perhaps training to staff around making sure that in this particular scenario, people aren't one, over collecting and over sharing. And that's really related to um, thinking about how you record information that you're told. Um, because in the, in the context of the example I've, I've given in relation to an employee's daughter with severe asthma, again, you don't need to record that. What, 
you, all you need to record is the fact that a family member is critical, critically vulnerable. Uh, one of the sort of key requirements under the GPR would be to carry out a legitimate interest uh, assessment. So this is an assessment that balances um, your employees' rights against your um, uh, rights as an organisation to use the data. And this is really important because it forms the legal justification for your use of the data. Um, given that the nature of the data you're collecting is health data, um, you need to think about um, implementing um, higher standards in relation to the collection and processing of that data. Um, so one of the things that you'll need to do is um, have in place uh, the oddly titled appropriate policy document. Um, so that's actually a, a legal requirement to have in place an appropriate policy document uh, when you're processing um, health data for employment purposes. Um, and that's needed to really set out your legal justification um, for using health data. That's a specific UK requirement. It's not something that you'll find um, generally in the EU G GDPR. It's something that is specific to the UK, but, but that is something that you need to have in place. Um, consider um, um, the enhanced security measures that you'll need to have in place to process um, uh, health data. I've mentioned stricter access, access for coal, uh, stricter access controls, um, password protected records, encryptions and read only access. And then also consider what additional training is required to staff, uh, for staff to handle um, this sensitive data, particularly HR staff. Um, lastly, um, you need to think about carrying out a data protection impact assessment. So this is an assessment that identifies any privacy risks associated with um, uh, any new activity um, you'll be undertaking in relation to the measures that you put in place um, relating to return to work. Um, so this identifies particular privacy risks and also you're supposed to document any mitigation any mitigating actions that you need to take in order to address those privacy risks. So uh, there's a legal requirement to carry out a DPIA um, where you're processing um, significant amounts of, of, of health data. So that could potentially be an issue depending on exactly what measures you're undertaking. Um, but in any event, this is something um, that is required as a, or, or, or should be considered as a matter of good practice. Okay, so turning to the next slide, Jess, please. So I've just set out here some of the um, regular questions that we get from, from, from clients relating to um, their um, return to work measures. So the, 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 one of the most frequent questions that people ask is, can we test our employees for, um, for COVID-19? Uh, the short answer is yes, but it would need to be uh, necessary and proportionate um, and so you would need to be able to justify it for health and safety reasons. Um, so if you think you need to test your employees in order to safeguard um, um, employees for health and safety reasons, then that would be you know, potentially permissible, but you would need to carry out a leg legitimate interest assessment and also data protection impact assessment. I think um, we need to consider that as um, um, uh, the rollout of the vaccination program continues and we get effective and widespread community, uh, widespread and um, effective immunity through, through, the, through our community, um, it may become harder to justify um, um, any kind of COVID-19 testing or even um, temperature testing. Um, another question we get asked a lot is, can we make testing mandatory? I think that's really difficult to um, to, to justify and um, uh, and also there's some um, issues that would need to be considered from an employment law perspective as to whether it is is, it is lawful and I think if it's un unlawful from um, an employment or health and safety perspective then it's then it's going to be um, unlawful from a from a privacy perspective as well. Can we use the government's workplace testing program? So the government have a program in place where um, um, uh, I think you needed to sign up before um, April, but ultimately um, uh, they will supply you with testing kits for your um, employees to test for um, um, COVID-19. Again, I think you need to be able to justify the use of this program. Is it really necessary 
um, for you to carry out an extensive testing program um, in order to keep people safe. Um, so you would need to go through the process of carrying out a legitimate interest assessment and a data protection impact assessment um, in order to verify that that, that, that that testing program is justified. Um, it's also worth noting that um, if you do use that program, uh, you will owe certain obligations to the government um, around sharing certain data with them, and you'll need to set up um, processes and protocols to share data with government. Um, and also they push down certain responsibilities to you, um, particularly around um, informing individuals, um, um, encouraging individuals to report using the government um, 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 uh, COVID-19 app and the track and trace program, and, and also um, um, obtaining consent. Next slide, please, Jess. Uh, so another question we get asked uh, regularly is, uh, do I need to ask for consent in using the health data of my employees? The short answer to this is no. Um, you do not need to ask for consent. And in fact, actually, we generally recommend that you um, don't ask, ask for consent because it's very hard to obtain valid consent from employees. But um, you do need a legal basis to use health data. And we would recommend um, what's called the legitimate interest ground. And, and it's in that context that you need to carry out a legitimate interest assessment. Um, uh, and then given that it's um, health data, you also need um, a further justification, um, which, which you should be able to rely on the fact that this is really to protect employees at work, so it satisfies your obligations around um, health and safety. Uh, can we collect contract, contact tracing data? Um, no, um, unless you have a legal obligation to um, collect this data. So that's something that um, organizations in the hospitality sector do. If you, if, if you don't have a legal obligation to uh, retain this data, you shouldn't really be collecting it just in case. Um, you know, clearly, you need to distinguish that from a situation where um, someone has tested positive for COVID-19 and need to identify certain contexts. But what you shouldn't be doing is collecting um, data in uh, just in case someone um, may, may test positive in the future. Uh, so can I collect data on um, uh, vaccinations of my employees? Uh, again, yes, you can do that, although um, your reason must be uh, clear and compelling. So one, one scenario in which that, that, that may be the case is um, if as a result of someone's um, uh, job role, they, um, they carry out international travel and you're booking that, it may be that um, um, you need to um, re retain some kind of vaccination record in order to, uh, for that employee to travel and for order, in order for you to, to book their travel. Um, another scenario, which I think is probably less relevant to, to most people on this webinar, will be if, um, for example, um, uh, you have staff who are um, um, at the front line in terms of um, health and, and treating people for, 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 for COVID-19. In, in that case, you, you may have a justification for maintaining uh, vaccination records. Um, um, if you have uh, no clear identified specified use for this information and are recording it just in case or you feel it's something you would like to know, uh, then you're really unlikely to be able to justify collecting it. You really have to have a clear need for maintaining um, vaccination records. Um, and of course, if you are collecting this data, uh, you need to make sure that you are using it for um, legitimate um, um, purposes.